welcome to Dielectric Videos. So, I was online a couple of months ago, and I came across what I thought was a pretty interesting uh, little piece of history here. Uh, this is a little ceramic uh, puppy dog, or a little porcelain puppy dog, and uh, I came across it in, uh, as I was actually searching for some vintage power cables. Uh, I was actually looking for uh, some kind of 1930s vintage uh, horsehair or cloth wrapped cabling like this, and uh, I came across this little guy and primarily bought him for the cable. And as you can see, it's the Electripup. Electripup. Supposedly a good to 15 amps at 125 volts. Uh, I am slightly dubious of that, but uh, anyway, I originally bought him with the intention of just taking the cord off right here, which is exactly what I did, and I actually made this lamp out of it. Uh, it's basically a cable with a light bulb at the end, and if I plug it in, yeah, it works very well. However, the problem I began to realize is uh, cables from the 1930s have a tendency for the insulation to kind of do this. Now, there's really nothing like inherently wrong with this uh, with this actual wiring inside, apart from its age. And the problem with its age is this stuff all falls off. So it really didn't make a very practical lamp because I was afraid it was going to like short out in here if it got bent too many times. And eventually, I mean, I figured it wouldn't be that great. Meanwhile, I actually grew a little bit of an attachment to the little pup. I thought he was quite cute. I thought uh, it was a nice little piece of history here. And uh, he had these, basically the way it works is there, as you can see, there are a few uh, little receptacles on each side of the pup. And I have taped over one of them because this one actually wouldn't work very well. It would crackle and make a poor connection, but the rest of them made pretty solid connections. So after I got tired of my lamp, which uh, is basically just falling apart right now, I decided that uh, I might be interested in putting this little guy back together with the original cable. And I was thinking for this channel, I might use the Electropup as my primary power source. As you can see right now, I have the so-called sketchy power box uh, connected, which I might talk about in a future video. Uh, just to be advised, it's not actually grounded, and thus that is why it is sketchy. But I'll go into where I got the power cable for it and all the information about this guy later on. So that being said, uh, you can see I have my soldering uh, gun here, my Weller Expert soldering gun, and I am planning on actually setting up uh, a video now to uh, show how I'm going to reconnect this guy to the original cable. So without further ado, I'll collect some more supplies and we can get started on uh, wiring up this Electropup and connecting the old cable back on and probably doing some heat shrink or uh, maybe some electrical tape to hold it on. All right, early. so I just got done uh, kind of preparing these connections to be made. Uh, as you can see, I have stripped down the wire, uh, pulled about half an inch off of either side and uh, I'm actually not nearly as confident in the performance of this any this wire anymore because when I was removing the uh, wire stripping like this these little things it just kind of crumbled in my hands and left all this kind of black stuff on the table. I actually have not uh, completely removed this last one. I uh, cut this uh, I cut the insulation down but haven't pulled it because I want to show you what I mean. Uh, it really. If you can see on the camera, I don't know if the autofocus will work very well, but it really is just like as I twist it off after I've cut it, it just kind of falls to bits. I mean, it does come off. So I'm definitely going to make note to be a bit careful with this because even if we do get it working today, uh, there's still a good chance that it could uh, lead to some unpleasant results if uh, it decides to get to short out, particularly if it gets bent at too strong of an angle or if it ends up like touching something that vibrates a lot. So we have to be careful of that. But that being said, I'm going to go through with uh, reattaching it. Uh, some t someday I might actually uh, cut out the porcelain on the bottom and replace all the internals with a little bit newer, better quality uh, plug. Uh, that way it's a little more robust for the future. But for now, I think it's probably good enough to get by and the way I'm going to set this up is I'm going to re-solder these together and before I do that I'm going to put these pieces of uh, shrink tube over the wires if I can 
And by putting the shrink tube over the wires, I'm going to basically prepare them to be shrunk on after I've soldered them. Now, uh, what that'll do is it'll basically provide an insulating layer between the two joints so that I don't have to use like plastic crimps that don't really look very, uh, very much the part for the age of this. As I said earlier, this was made in the mid-1930s, so it's roughly 80 years old at this point, and I don't think putting some little plastic crimps on it is uh, exactly fitting with the style. So what I'm going to try to do now is twist them together and apply some solder. Now it's going to be tricky because it's hard to tell in the video, but uh, there's a lot of oxidation on this copper. Now copper oxide is not a terrible conductor. It's a it's a not a great insulator, but it's not a great conductor either. And as a result, it will probably have higher resistance at these junctions. The other problem with copper oxide is it tends to not like solder very much, so that means getting the solder to flow across the joints might be a little bit tricky. That's why I'm using my Weller Expert gun, which is a very high-powered uh, soldering gun, and I'm using some Archer Rosin Core solder. I believe this is 6040, which uh, means it has lead and tin in it, so not exactly the most environmentally friendly stuff but it should flow quite nicely onto the junctions. So what I'm gonna to try to do now is uh, wire these things together, and I don't think the polarity really matters. It is an unpolarized appliance, um, but I'm gonna be consistent. One of the wires has these little black and white dots on it, so I'm gonna be consistent and keep that wired to the other wire with the little black and white dots on it. So I'm going to try to get these twisted reasonably well together. Uh, it might take a couple of tries because the wiring is so old, but uh, now I'm going to see if I can flow some solder onto it. And it looks like it's almost time for me to get a new tip on this iron, but I'm going to see if I can get away with this one. If not, I might come back uh, in another video or another part of this video with a new tip installed. So I'm going to let it heat up. Normally it heats up a lot faster, but as I said, the tip is a little bit uh, showing its age. Yeah, it's getting hot enough to melt the solder. So uh, the, yeah, it's really not wanting to flow very well. Uh, I'm, I'm giving it a lot of solder and it's just kind of balling up. Oh, see, it just dripped onto the table, uh, which is not what we want to see. If I hold this against the wire long enough, though, it might kind of heat the wire up to the point that the solder will gradually start melting into the wire. So it's starting to go, yeah, it's, it's making progress. If I move it up and down a little bit, it should kind of soak into the copper and hopefully get through that oxide layer. Now, I'm gonna let it cool for a little bit because I can smell this, uh, this cotton fiber stuff starting to burn, which of course is the result of the uh, solder being hot. So I'm gonna now go back on and give it another couple of uh, Little bit, another little bit of uh, solder and a little bit more time and hopefully it will really flow into the wire nicely and make a good bond because what we don't want is for it to come apart with 120 volts exposed because that would be a kind of an exciting thing and not in a good way. So now I'm going to inspect this joint a little bit to make sure it's actually good and it looks like it's uh, mostly bonded on one side the other side not so much, so I'm going to give it another hit on the other side and see how that goes. So I'm applying the solder to the other side here, and it looks like it is definitely flowing better now that I've given it some time. However, the rubber on the wire is getting very hot, but since I'm going to shrink wrap over it, not a big deal. Now, it looks like I've got some excess on here, so I'll try to kind of evenly distribute it since I did add a little extra to try to get it to go initially. So, looks like now it's a little bit better off, and, oop, that's quite hot. But now you can see I can tug on this, and it's a really solid connection. The only problem, of course, is the crud insulation elsewhere. The solder here is going to hold on nicely, nice and strong. So, I'm going to go do the other side the same way. I won't... Uh, I won't bore you with all of that time in the videos, so the next time I come on you'll be able to see me shrink the heat shrink onto this thing. Alright, so I got the final solder connections made here, and uh, now it's pretty much onto the stage where we want to put the shrink wrap on. Now I've learned the hard way that uh, it's very easy to underestimate how hot solder is. Uh, 
human skin has a high specific heat capacity since there's water in it, and you might just touch the solder after you're done and say, oh, cool enough. But when you then slide the, uh, the heat shrink over it, suddenly you'll find that the heat shrink shrinks up before you even get it on the solder. That's because the solder is still actually very hot. You just can't tell that it is because if you only touch it for a second, it, uh, it'll heat up your hand much more slowly than if it, uh, you slide this heat shrink over it and suddenly the heat shrink gets just as hot as the solder because it has a very low specific heat capacity. Then it'll shrink up on it. So what I always recommend is before you slide the heat shrink over it, make sure you can keep your fingers on the solder joint for a good amount of time to make sure it's really nice and cool. Because otherwise your heat shrink will shrink up halfway on and then you'll have to desolder it and try again, which is a real bear. So hopefully I'm gonna be able to slide this over. The, the cord did fray a bit more when it got hot, which could make it a challenge to get this uh, shrink on top of it. Um, but if I think if we coerce it a little bit, and maybe if we trim this up a little bit, uh, it should go on a, a bit more smoothly. That would be the hope. Uh, it looks like, ah, there we go, there we go. So it's almost on there all the way. Ah, there, I got it, and I gotta go the other way. Maybe I didn't use enough heat shrink. Anyway, it looks close enough. I'll get the other heat shrink wrap on the other side and uh, kind of do the same. I have to get it over that uh, kind of frayed out part here. And if I can do that, I need to make sure, because what I want to make sure is that it's not going to have a, uh, a place where you could accidentally expose part of the wire and then have it touch together and short. So now that the heat shrink is on the wire here, uh, I should be able to proceed to the heat stage. So I've got this, uh, I think it's, I don't know how many watts, it's, uh, let's see, 10 amp, 1200 watt heat gun right here. And I'm going to hook that up and get it nice and toasty. I'm going to kind of lift it up in the air so it doesn't burn the table too much. Uh, so here we go. And hopefully, if it goes well, it should shrink right up and make a good, clean seal. And I'll do it from the other side, too. That should be good. So we'll let that cool for a little bit, because the heat gun will heat it up quite quickly. And let's see. Looks pretty good. I don't really feel... It's not, it doesn't look like it's going to slide anywhere, and it looks reasonably stable. I might put some electrical tape around here just to kind of keep things contained, but in kind of this keeping the spirit of the original cable, I might just keep it as is. So are we ready for the exciting test? Because it looks like this is probably going to hold. So I'll get my sketchy power box out and hopefully it doesn't go kablam. Let's find out. Looks like it didn't. All right, uh, I'll kind of touch them together a little, make sure they're uh, pretty solid. Yeah, it looks good enough. All right, it's a little bit uh, bodged on. In the future, I might definitely consider adding uh, a new cord, although I do quite like the look of the vintage cord. I do know you can buy vintage looking cords nowadays that uh, are actually, they have the PVC insulation under the cloth and it uh, actually meets UL standards. Obviously this would never pass code and certainly it shouldn't be able to withstand 15 amps, although maybe it would, I don't know. Anyway, uh, to test it, I'm going to get the uh, first, I guess I'll get the soldering gun and see if the light comes on. So I'll show you how this works. You just pop it right in the side there like that. And let's see if we've got power. Yes, it, let me get it in the camera. We do have power. And that's a very good thing. Why don't we even get something bigger? How about the big heat gun? And we'll just see if that has any chance of working. It should because supposedly it can do 15 amps. However, I'm going to have to go find a ground lift. Well, Technically, I could just use my sketchy power box as a ground lift because it doesn't have a grounding conductor on the end. That's why it's so sketchy, but also it makes it quite useful at the same time. And you'll see in a later video that I have this all hooked up to an isolation transformer to make it a bit safer without all, this, all the grounding. That way I can uh, basically avoid getting shocked if something goes live and I'm touching it. I'll talk about that in a future video.
So I've connected it uh, to my power supply here, which uh, should work quite well. Let me get these other cables out of the way. And now I'm going to plug in, I'll try the back plug this time. Let's do that, see how that works. So here's my sketchy power box. And let's see, uh, I can actually, I might have a ground lift around here, but uh, what I can do is get this kilowatt meter, plug it in here, and when it boots up, I'll be able to show you the voltage. So we're getting about 124 volts uh, out of the wall here, and or rather out of the transformer. The transformer does have a slight voltage gain, so I probably right about bang on at 120 coming out of the wall. If I go down, I can show amperage or I can show wattage, and I'm going to stick it on, uh, let's go up to amperage since that's what's going to heat the wires up. And I'm going to hook this up and just see if it can uh, hold up a bit. So let's uh, try this out. All right, I have turned the gun on and uh, the nine amps straight on. Let's see if there's any crackle if I move this back and forth. Looks pretty solid. I think we may have done it. Well, if it does continue to operate uh, with this level of reliability, I would say we've got ourselves a little power supply. So in future videos, you'll probably see me using this little guy, the Electropup in action. So thank you for watching Dielectric videos. And as always, don't try anything you've seen at home. None of this is UL listed, code approved, or anything like that. So if you're going to do it, Try not to burn your house down. Thank you and have a good one.